Please join me in welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just, just a, a small correction. It's uh, museum studies. I used to teach museum studies at the Institute of American Indian Art. Well, Tense, Michelle McGowan, Neskiga San, Miska Weska Skiagan. Greetings. Uh, my name is Michelle McGow, and I come from a place known uh, amongst my grandmother's people as Beaver Hills, situated in the plains, in the territories of what is now presently known as Alberta, Canada. I'm of indigenous and settler descent. Uh, my father was an immigrant from Northern Ireland, and my mother was Cree Métis, uh, with a little bit of Welsh mixed in there. Uh, I introduced myself in this manner as a way of situating myself within uh, the context of my talk. I also identify as queer two-spirit. I also want to acknowledge uh, that I'm un an uninvited guest in these territories. And I wish to express my gratitude uh, to the original caretakers and to recognize these nations' sovereignty over the territories that uh, uh, we are meeting today. <clears throat> What I'll be presenting today is my research from my dissertation, The Indigenous Sovereign Body, Gender, Sexuality, and Performance. This project is part of a lifelong inquiry into the exploration of the ways in which indigenous people construct knowledge regarding gender and sexuality. I would be remiss if I did not uh, admit to both having a political and personal interest in this research as it is my desire that this project will contribute to the growing body of works that seeks to create a different future for those who identify as non-binary and reject heteronormativity and heteropatriarchy. Within the discipline of art history, uh, gender variance in relation to artistic production is not a topic that is often discussed. In fact, general gender variance, and in particular, its relationship to sexual orientation was not a topic studied outside the medical community until the mid 20th century. It was generally thought that gender and sexuality were biologically determined, and deviation from the heterosexual norm was considered pathological. In contrast, indigenous nations in what is now called North America had a very different understanding regarding the relationship between gender, biology, and one's sexual object of choice. However, due to colonization, internalized homophobia continues to ravage our communities and silence voices. One of the questions that has driven my inquiry is what are the consequences for indigenous nation building and sovereignty if we maintain constructions of gender that per perpetuate, sorry, perpetuate heteronormativity and heteropatriarchy? Through the discussion of historical and contemporary indigenous artists and their art practice, I will demonstrate how indigenous knowledge and methodologies can provide us with a more nuanced understanding of their artistic production while also asserting indigenous sovereignty. This type of inquiry, according to Scott Laura Morgensink, quote, challenges colonial formations of modern sexualities by denaturalizing settlement, reimagining native knowledge, and fostering native survivance, end of quote. As indigenous scholar Michael Lerma explains, contemporary indigenous sovereignty is a complex and, multi and multifaceted. His model outlining the five components of contemporary indigenous sovereignty was central to my research. Even though all five components are equally important, I focus on demonstrating on how indigenous, the indigenous sovereign body asserts a sovereignty that is intimately tied to and, legitima and legitimized through sacred histories, ceremony, traditional homelands, and our languages. It is these histories, ceremonies, and languages that provide evidence of how knowledge regarding gender and sexuality is constructed from an indigenous perspective. They also demonstrate that when the indigenous body embodies or performs from this place, it is capable of revealing the binary construction of gender and its conflation with biological sex as part of the colonial mechanism that serves to regulate the sovereignty of indigenous bodies. A notion so eloquently outlined in Mark Rifkin's book titled, When Did Indians Become Straight? Kinship and the History of Sexuality and Native Sovereignty. 
As illustrated in Lerma's model, contemporary indigenous sovereignty is enacted through the development of theory, using new foci of, in our research, and the generation of data. I, too, set out to examine the development of theory regarding indigenous genders and sexuality, while also bringing into the discussion recent indigenous interventions that have occurred within the discipline of gender studies, feminism, and queer theory. New theory linking the, linking the reclaiming of indigenous constructions of gender and sexuality with indigenous sovereignty have, has been generated from the disciplines, academic disciplines of indigenous feminisms, indigenous studies, and what Quo Lee Driscoll has described as a two-spirit critique. Driscoll writes, quote, that while our traditional understandings of gender and sexuality are as diverse as our nations, Native two-spirit LGBTQ people have share experiences under heteropatriarchal, gender-polarized colonial regimes which attempt to control Native nations. These experiences give rise to, the, to that position, that position Native two-spirit LGBTQ genders and sexualities as oppositional to colonial powers, end of quote. In keeping with this model, my research focuses not so much on refuting what has been written concerning gender fluidity, but rather emphasizes and examines how artists' gender and sexual sexualities perform, how artists' gender and sexual sexualities perform these identities to affirm the fluidity of indigenous constructions of gender and sexuality. I not only employ indigenous methodologies, I also activate what Robert Warrior identifies as decolonial gestures by making indigenous knowledge central to my inquiry and in doing so disrupt the settler colonial authority over the construction of knowledge. We can look to the early 20th century for examples of indigenous bodies that performed a knowledge that challenged Western gender and sexual identities. Hosting Claw was a weaver, while Go On Go was a vaudeville actress. Both of these individuals lived during a time when settler colonial governments asserted some of their most violent policies of assimilations, policies that continue to resonate throughout indigenous communities. I also present these stories with a specific purpose in mind in that these individuals' lives are demonstrative, demonstrative of what Gerald Visners has described as survivance. This term is defined as both the survival of and resistance to the violence of settler colonial logics. I do this as a means of grounding indigenous gender constructions within an indigenous history that until very recently has remained unspoken. Hosting Claw was born in 1867, prior to the signing of the Treaty of Bosco Redondo. This treaty facilitated the return of the Dene people to their homelands after four years of being held as political prisoners by the United States government. My inquiry examines the ways in which Hosting's role as a Nahle, weaver, and singer are expressions of a very specific ontology and epistemology. My inquiry examines the ways in which Hosting's role as a Natale, weaver, and singer, oh, sorry. Although Hosting Kla has been given, has been the subject of a number of scholarly inquiries, I engage a Dene specific ontology to examine how Hosting's gender and artistic production are the synthesis of the Dene concept of Hazon. <coughs> this reading of the work is influenced by Aaron Fry's ethno-theoretical approach. Because I'm not Dene, I relied heavily on the writings of Wesley Thomas, a Dene scholar. A, a Dene scholar. I employed Thomas's research on the traditional teachings and language of the Dene people to argue that Hostings embodied a very specific Dene ontology regarding gender, and it is from this understanding that he produced the sand painting textiles. The Natale had many roles within the community. Many were weavers. Therefore, it was not unusual that Hastin was a, um, not unusual that he was a weaver, but he was also a Natale or a Hatale or singer. The textiles he and his family produced merged the cultural knowledge of these two roles. <coughs> 
What was unusual was Hastin's decision to defy protocol by weaving a permanent form, a permanent form of the sand paintings. Sand paintings are meant to be ephemeral. They are not only created with, they are only to be created within the context of healing, and once the ceremony is finished, the sand painting is to be destroyed. Although it can be inferred that Claw's choice to create permanent forms as the sand paintings as a response to the fear of this knowledge being lost, I offer another explanation that takes into account the fact that Claw was a Natale. As such, he embodied both feminist, feminism, excuse me, feminist, femaleness. We're having a hard day today. <laughs> Lips are sticking to the teeth. Sorry. So as uh, he embodied the femaleness that is associated with the active aspect of reality and the maleness associated with the static aspect. His maleness allowed him to learn the ceremony, the ritual, but it was his femaleness that was marked by the active, vital, creative, pro and productive that was realized in his weaving. To break taboo, and to give permanent form to sand paintings was a way of ensuring that the static nature of the sand paintings, um, as dictated by cultural protocol, would be preserved. A record of the chant ways he knew would thus be passed on to successive generations of Dene Hatale. Claude's life and art are evidence of how the Dene construct gender and how his embodiment of a Dene ontology how he embodied a Dene ontology in his day-to-day -day life as a weaver, a Natale, and as a Dene person. This image of Go Wan Go in a velvet suit and leather boots is also a reminder of a way in which Native Americans embrace different constructions of gender. Go Wan Go performed an indigenous understanding of, indig of gender fluidity as a means to subvert the construction of the Aboriginal as uncivilized. As the first Native American playwright, Go One Go's life and the retelling of it is an example of what Scott Lawrence refers to as rhetorical sovereignty. Quote, the inherent right and ability of people to determine their own communicative needs and desires in this pursuit, to, to decide for themselves the goals, modes, styles, and languages of public discourse. End of quote. Implying her craft, Go on Go Mohawk brought into the realm of public discourse a construction of Native American masculinity that differed from popular stereotypes. Go on Go was born in 1860 in Cattaraugus, New York, during an era of change marked by rapid industrialization and the rise of the middle class. Caroline Carolina, or Carrie, as she was known in her formative years, was the only child of Ellen and Lydia Mohawk. Although Carolina did not grow up on the Seneca Reservation in Upper State New York, she would take the stage name Go One Go Mohawk as an acknowledgement of her Seneca heritage. Capitalizing on the popularity of Buffalo Bill's Wild West shows, Go Wan Go's presentation of the Western frontier in her plays and performances disrupts the narrative of manifest destiny. In her roles as the Native American male protagonist in the plays Weptum No Ma, The Indian Mail Carrier, and Flaming Arrow, she did not portray Native Americans as victims, but as heroes. For non-Native audiences, Go Wan Go's portrayal as a male protagonist may have been a novelty. But the oral traditions of many Native American cultures present gender fluidity in what is known as coyote or trickster stories. Although the trickster is often portrayed as male, the sexual ambiguity of the trickster is well documented. This ambiguity, according to Widget, reveals the critical function of the trickster which, quote, is not so much to call cultural categories into question, but to demonstrate the artificiality of culture itself, end of quote. While her main goal was to present Native Americans as being just as civilized as their settler colonial brethren, while also advocating for the political rights of indigenous people, her performances as the male protagonist contribute to an unsettling of the binary construction of gender. <coughs> 
I also have some more pictures of her. In the 60 years between the creative acts of these two historical figures and the beginning of the Two-Spirit Movement in the 1990s, Native American people who did not conform to settler colonial gender and sexual constructs often lived their lives in secrecy. The revitalization of institutions and practices that began in the 1990s was seen at the time as an effort by contemporary Native Americans who identified as gay, lesbian, bisexual, transsexual, and queer to distance themselves from the mainstream LGBTQ2 community and to root contemporary indigenous sexual and gender identities within indigenous constructs and logics. The effect of the Two-Spirit Movement was to denaturalize the sexual and gender constructions of settler colonialism. This movement, along with recent scholarly interventions by indigenous Two-Spirit scholars, artists, and their allies, has called attention to the ways in which LGBTQ2 theory has failed to engage in a critique that examines its own complacence in settler colonialism. Fortunately, these critiques have not only exposed the ways in which settler colonialism, heteropatriarchy, and heteronormativity are interconnected, but it also has created spaces to engage with other ways of knowing and seeing and being that have been in existence since time immemorial. Cree artist Kent Monkman's artistic production has played a key role in pushing back against the normalized settler colonial logics. Most of the discussion regarding Monkman's artistic practice as a painter and as a performance artist has centered on indigenous queer theories critique of gender binaries. In particular, how his, his work makes visible indigenous knowledges and ways of being. His alter ego, Miss Chief Eagle Testicle, who appears in his paintings and on occasion comes to life in his performances, is viewed as the embodiment of the variances of genders that were known to existed among many Native American communities. In his series of paintings entitled Moral Landscapes, Monkman critiques settler colonial narratives in which the indigenous body and presence are erased from the landscape. In these paintings, he illustrates a gendered narrative that expresses indigenous knowledge and ways of being that settler colonial societies have attempted to subjugate and eliminate. Although mainstream reviews of his work have attempted to classify Monkman's performance of Miss Chief Eagle Testicle as drag, Monkman dismisses this stating, stating I don't quote, I don't think of it as drag. I see Miss Chief as being too spirited. So it's not about trying to be a female impersonator. What I really like to distinguish what I'm doing from what is more commonly known as drag. I'm very careful about crossing that line and keeping it more rare, end of quote. As Métis call, uh, scholar June Chudelier writes, Monkman's artistic productions enact what two-spirit Cree Cherokee scholar Kwo Lee Disco has identified as the sovereign erotic. For other artists, this enactment of other ways of knowing is manifested differently. Rosalie Faval came into her gender and sexual identity in the late 1970s. Growing up in the urban center of Winnipeg, Manitoba, Faval talks about coming out. Quote, it was scary, it was difficult, it was turning yourself inside out, trying to figure out what's going on. But it was rewarding as I felt like I found a part of myself. I found that little group of people to hang out with, end of quote. In her late 20s, she became involved with Winnipeg's Indigenous Women's Community as she worked on creating a series of portraits of Aboriginal women. It was through this network of relationships that she met and began an intimate relationship with another Indigenous woman. The relationship became the subject of the photographic series, Living Evidence. Living Evidence consists of 30 photographic portraits of Havel and her lover. These private interludes between lovers take on a larger-than-life presence as the original images are enlarged to 33 by 68 centimeters for their presentation in the gallery. Excerpts from personal diaries sharing Favel's private thoughts written in white ink on the photographs reinforce the tension created by this act. <coughs> 
living evidence put into motion the mechanism used by settler colonial institutions to reify heteronormativity. When the art institution demanded that Favel obtain written permission from her ex-lover to show the images or the exhibition would be canceled. And I just need to add that she had verbal permission uh, from her uh, ex to uh, show these images, but they demanded uh, that it be uh, in a written form. And at that time, uh, it was difficult to find the individual to get the permissions. Uh, the duct tape was added to the photographs to mask her ex-lover's identity when Favo was unable to obtain a written permission. The curator of the exhibition, Ingrid Jenker, points out that having to conceal her ex-lover's identity, Favo reveals the homophobia that pervades settler colonial nations, nation states. It also serves as an example of the effects of colonization that have contributed to the erasure of the collective memories within our families and communities, resulting in the isolation and judgment leveled at those whose gender and sexual identities do not conform to heteronormativity. It also speaks to the internalization of racism. The absence or lack of access to information about indigenous traditional teachings concerning gender and sexual identities often has violent repercussions. Colonization and its institutions have all but erased this knowledge for indigenous constructions of gender and sexuality in many communities. Cree artist Thursa Cuthead explores this absence of knowledge consistently and often humorously in her artistic practice. Cuthand in 19, uh, in uh, excuse me, 2015, Cuthand was commissioned by Imaginative to produce one of her more recent uh, projects entitled Two Spirit Introductory Offer 1999. Uh, the video appears to be a lighthearted glimpse into the issues encountered by Two Spirit persons, persons coming out. However, underlying the humor is the acknowledgement of the knowledge that has been loss concerning two-spirit identities that include gender variants and sexual identities that are not heteronormative. Cut Hand's video acknowledges the unique cir circumstances that two-spirit people face within a mainstream queer world. The dialogue reflects many of the issues and questions Cut Hand had when she came out in her teens, including finding a community she felt comfortable with. Both of these artists, artists deal with the absence of knowledge regarding indigenous constructions of gender and sexuality as a result of colonization and missionization of their ancestors. In contrast to Favel and Cuthan, Anishinaabe artist Barry Ace recalls his experiences of coming out in the 1990s. Although his, his, his identities were never questioned, they were never overtly acknowledged. ACE's artistic production is an example of how the artist's process or subject matter reflects a pattern of renewal of indigenous knowledge regarding these variances in gender. At the age of 16, ACE began his apprenticeship with the women in his family and was schooled in the arts of basketry, quill work, beading, and beading, normally the purview of cisgendered women. Throughout his apprenticeship, Ace learned the skills to work in these mediums, and in keeping with protocol, he also learned the cultural practices and ceremonial knowledge that accompanied them. Although Ace states that he seldom deals with his sexuality in his work, recently he created a number of works that deal with the common history shared among LGBTQ2 and two-spirited uh, two-spirit people on both sides of the border. In one of his latest contemporary reiterations of, the indigenous, of an indigenous aesthetic, Erased, created for the Queer Landscapes, Queer Intersections exhibition in Toronto, Ace addresses the impact of AIDS had on the, on the indigenous community. In his work, Ace presents a pair of brightly colored embellished cowboy boots. In the exhibition catalog, Ace explains the intent of this work. Quote, like trailing fringe on indigenous footwear erasing the tracks of the wearer, AIDS erased the lives of friends and lovers. As the privileged class marginalized the queer community to take care of our infected and dying. Through activism, we challenge homophobia for our survival and healing. 
like Anishinaab, Anishinaabic floral medicine motifs, the digital age provides a new connectivity for sharing and healing so that our lives of our courageous warriors who pushed our community forward will not be forgotten, end of quote. His apprenticeship, like his artwork, are, a sim are symbolic of the renewal, renewal ceremonies that maintain our cultural ties to each other and our ways of understanding that include the need to embrace all of our relations, regardless of their gender and or sexual identity. Adrian Simpson performs as Buffalo Boy are also a form of renewal. The self-described trickster was born into a Blackfoot family. Trained formally as a painter, Simpson began engaging in performance art while attending graduate school at the University of Saskatchewan. Lynn Bell describes Simpson's performances by his alter ego as in keeping with the chaotic tradition of the trickster. Quote, Buffalo Boy restages and resignifies various colonial encounters in the past and the present as high camp theater in which everything is done in quotations and nothing is what it seems to be, end of quote. Simpson refuses any label of any kind and especially the reference of his work being camp. What he says is that often, quote, often the trickster, they went to different places. They all allowed themselves to be conduits for the spiritual in many ways. In Jeff Thomas's photograph, Buffalo Boy poses in a defiant, haughty manner against the settler colonial monument to the doctrine of discovery the base of the statue of Samuel de Champlain. This photograph speaks of how the performance as a form of storytelling can be a form of survivance. It can make stories visible and present and present ways of knowing that counter dominant nor narratives. In doing so, performance can speak to the survival and resistance of indigenous people. As art historian Carla Taunton writes, quote, indigenous performance art is an art practice engaged in the colonial and neo-colonial occupations and in the articulations of indigenous sovereignty, agency, and cultural autonomy, end of quote. Whenever the trickster is invoked, one situates his or her art practice as either being grounded in or at the very least acknowledging indigenous worldviews. Simpson's performances are rituals that bring older ways of knowing into a contemporary context. Rather than focusing on renewal of gender and sexual identities, the newest generation of indigenous LGBTQ to queer two-spirit artists are asking what are the possibilities that can be set into motion by indigenous sovereignty and self-determination? What does decolonizing gender and sexuality look like? This new generation of artists not only sets out to reclaim the knowledge regarding gender and sexual identities that have been that have created a space for the two-spirit body to reemerge, but they are also exploring what other spaces can be opened up by this activation. As activists, they are addressing the gendered violence of settler colonialism through their artistic practice. Questioning the settler forms of sexuality and the differentiation between the pornographic and erotic Dana Danger describes her current work as an exploration of, quote, the complicated dynamics of sexuality, gender, and power in a consensual fe and feminist manner, end of quote. These complicated dynamics she refers to are the ways in which bondage, discipline, dominance, and submission, sadomasochism, can reveal the gendered violence of settler colonialism and the ways in which indigenous women and two-spirit people are disempowered within a patriarchal society. In her series, Mask One, dangerous collaborators wear black-on-black -black beaded leather fetish mask. Each mask is beaded with a distinctive design. This beadwork creates a tension between the anonymity of the fetish mask rep uh, represented in BDSM practice and the function of beadwork within an indigenous context. Beadwork often is used to, as a signifier of one's indigeneity. And beadwork designs, especially those on regalia, often have very deep and personal significance. Beadwork can signify a person's um, 
tribal identity, their clan identity, and their family history. In these instances, the bead work on the mass is based on the wearer's tattoos. Danger explains that her process is collaborative because those participating have agency and there is a reciprocity in the relationship between herself and the cis and trans women she photographs. Danger shares that she does not have her collaborators sign model releases because she does not want to own the images. Each time she displays the works, she must renegotiate the terms. The empowerment for the women participating in the photographs comes from their in agency. Erin Cosmos describes herself as a soft-taught, community-engaged, visual, and multimedia uh, indigenous artist. She identifies as uh, Métis Cree and grew up in Alberta with familiar ties in the Métis communities of Onaway and Lac Saint Anne. Her artwork brings together these interests in her community-engaged projects that extend from her position as the coordinator of the Native Youth Sexual Health Network Media Arts Justice Projects. The media arts are seen as a quote, as a way, quote, not only to push back on demeaning and, and or stereotyping mainstream narratives, but also collectively create new visions, end of quote. Cosmont's uh, artistic production consistently addresses the intersectionality between gender, sexuality, colonial violence, and capitalism. This is the topic of her poster entitled, Our Bodies Are Not Terranilis. The iconography Cosmos empl employs relays a complex narrative that speaks to the violence of settler colonialism. She not only refers to the indigenous body and its long complicated relationship with Christian religions, but also draws a parallel between the violence enacted upon the indigenous body and the violence of resource extraction that is occurring in contemporary times. In summary, the hegemony of hetero heteronormativity and its expression in homophobia and transphobia has real consequences. As demonstrated in the artwork of Favel and Cuthan, ACE's artistic production, uh, artistic practice is an example of the renewal of those traditions that were once seen uh, by outsiders as the purview of women, yet taught to, this taught to this man as a young boy. Simpson's performances are viewed similarity as a renewal of cultural knowledge regarding gender and sexuality. Simpson's form of cultural continuance is founded in Buffalo Boy's performative acts of renewing the energy embodied by Nappy, the trickster. To go beyond these understandings, it is important to look at the way artists are not only reclaiming indigenous knowledge regarding gender, fluidity, and sexuality, but also redefining them. The artwork of Danger and Cosmos is important, but the real possibilities for decolonization of indigenous people lies in their process. Both artists understand the profound colonial history of residential schools, sexual abuse, and intergenerational trauma has had on all indigenous people. The intent of this inquiry is not only to look at how Native American people construct knowledge regarding gender and sexuality, but how these understandings are embodied in the artistic practice of artists, the artists that I've spoken about. The artwork created by all of the artists discuss, discuss our responses to our colonial state, and as such, present a different understanding of gender and sexuality that is not binary, nor is gender and sexuality conflated with biological state, sex. The presentation of both historical and contemporary case studies of indigenous artists indicates the resistance to colonial subject, resistance to colonial subjectivity is ongoing. However, <coughs> excuse me, however, the hegemony of settler colonialism continues to have a severe impact on the acceptance of non-binary gender and sexual identities. I contend that to assert different ways of knowing is to assert a sovereignty as nations and as citizens of those nations. To reclaim non-binary gender and sexual identities is a political and revolutionary act. It is ultimately dependent upon reclaiming indigenous sacred histories, ceremonies, our traditional homelands, and our languages. Thank you. <laughs>
questions and um, I'll help out with that. the role or position of the heteronormative colonial visual language. Like for example, like the like the stereotype of masculinity or femininity that we understand in the heteronormative uh, environment and that its role in the making process of these artists' artworks. Because um, like even from the earlier like uh, example of Go and Go, like I could see that they are like well aware of that the heteronormative like language and then they are playing kind of playing with the language and then trying to subvert that but mm -hmm. still you know like the audience is like colonial like heteronormative people and then um it seems like some artists they did not reject the language itself like totally and then even like they uh, embrace the these kind of oppressive elements in their artworks so i'm kind of curious of that dynamic? I think one of the things too is like with a lot uh, to, to talk in, in terms of language like within many indigenous languages there is no gender so uh, it, for the Cree language it's either animate or inanimate uh, so yes they are subverting I think you know like go on go it's just like a perfect example in terms of of how she kind of uh, it's kind of like in terms of, uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of some of the, the writings of um, disidentification. And uh, you know, that. so I think that that's what's happening in a lot of these works is just basically, uh, this, they're, they're aware of it and yet they know how, and the, the power of subverting it. And I think that, you know, Go One Go is a really good example of that. Um, she was really, really very savvy. She was a businesswoman. She had this troop of people, um, and she traveled all over the United States and Canada, and and went to Europe um, at a time when women, you know, didn't have you know the same kinds of access to funding, um, even you know like bank accounts and things like that. And she had this troop of people that she was responsible for, and she took all over. So she was. She was really savvy in that regard. But was it because of her identity as a like two spirit or um, like indigenous um, or something like that? Her success? I no, you know, I think like two spirit is kind of a contemporary term and it's something that that is an umbrella term that was developed in the 1990s. Uh, prior to that, in many instances, there are um, within indigenous languages words that are specifically um, used to refer to someone that um, occupies this kind of uh, fluid space. Um, and so I wouldn't say that for her um, that it was you know, particular because she was someone that played with the fluidity. She was married, but she was married to a much older man. Um, and you think of, you know, like women couldn't have property or own property, very, very limited in what they could own. So she, she kind of had these allies that she, she had uh, in all of her different parts of her life that enabled her to move. Uh, through these spaces that would not normally be open for women to move. Because even in terms of performance, um, to, for ha an indigenous person to play an indigenous part, that was unheard of. They were always played by red face uh, at that time. Yes. Michelle, that was fascinating. Thank you. Uh, I'm Ignacio from Tiger um, I uh, wanted to ask you about uh, institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned briefly uh, the institutional context for uh, oh, Dennis uh, Favel um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and her work and how it was kind of dealt with. But I'm thinking more broadly about uh, especially how institutions in Canada have been uh, involved in um, the staging in, in certain in certain regards mm -hmm. of particular forms of uh, 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 <coughs> artistic practice. I'm thinking particularly about Monkman and mm -hmm. his kind of immense popularity mm -hmm. and circulation within kind of the mainstream uh, 
art establishment. So I was wondering whether you could speak a bit about the dynamics of subversion and their kind of the, the kind of uh, difficult negotiation mm -hmm. of these, of these large-scale institutional spaces and their tendency to appropriate. Right. I would say probably two things that kind of come into operation is that Favel was doing this much earlier. Yeah. Uh, so the context, the time, uh, actually has an impact in terms of, uh, you know, we're all pretty much aware that a lot of things that have occurred, you know, um, in the last, you know, 20 years, even the last five years, that open up these spaces for individuals like Monkman to kind of appear. But I also think because of um, his, his, his work is seen as, you know, the performance. Um, and so it's something that he can put on and take off. So I think that that also has something to do with the acceptance of it. But it's also he uses humor in a lot of um, his images. But it also, I, I, it's also somewhat problematic as well because just inverting you know, that power isn't really doing that much. But he was kind of somebody that was taken up by by the mainstream, by uh, mag you know, like who gets re um, the stories, those kinds of things. Um, and so he's kind of been elevated to this position. Um, and so he's this individual that, oh, you want somebody that's too spirited in the show? Well, get a piece of Monkman's work. You know what I mean? So he's, he's become that way and he's filled that space. Um, I'm not sure if that I kind of answered, but it is also the responsibility to, uh, as us as curators, to um, actually go out into uh, the spaces, into the communities, and talk to people and see the artwork that is uh, being created, and creating, you know, um, these spaces for other other experiences uh, to be uh, seen and um, celebrated. Mm -hmm. I think we're seeing more of a shift within indigenous communities because I think we under, we're beginning to understand the role that missionization has played. And when we talk about traditional, you know, what are we, what are we re referencing in terms of traditional? Because, and just recently, I think it was uh, Thursa Cuthan uh, just had a film come out about maybe five days ago called Woman Dress. And it's talking about this oral history of this of this individual that went from camp to camp, and but it's uh, uh, the story of this two spirited individual that we call it in contemporary times, um, and it was a story that she'd heard uh, what her aunt had heard from her grandfather, and the aunt actually says in the film that yeah he was a little bit shy about talking about this because uh, you know uh, in the past, especially because of missionization, uh, that um, these stories were silenced. Uh, these histories were silenced. You know, our aunts and uncles uh, lived in the closet kind of thing. So I think that when we think about traditional, we have to be really careful about that kind of label. But I think that we're finding, not in all communities, but more often, um, we're still finding that there's more acceptance and there's also more stories that are, are being talked about or being shared. Thank you very much for your amazing talk. Um, I was wondering if you could say more about 1999 and Teresa Cuthan's work. I was really mm -hmm. curious yeah. about that. I want to hear a bit more about what that is doing in that um, practice, mm -hmm. and that um, art object, right. and also more broadly in terms of intervention. Right. So it's a great little, it's a great video, and there's uh, three other people in the video. So they take, they're talking about, uh, for example, uh, for some individuals that didn't grow up with knowledge around uh, different um, gender identities, the book that everyone read was Spirit in the Flesh. So she holds up, you know, like you can get your own copy of Spirit in the Flesh. Um, there's also uh, 
for example, finding elders, you know, elders that uh, you can talk to about this because in many instances, like you were bringing up, the, you know, the, the, the violence of settler colonialism has in many instances um, silenced these kinds of stories and even acceptance within communities. And they've had really very violent uh, repercussions. So, and then she talks about um, that if you sign up, you get, you know, like a gift a month, you know, so there's the beaded um, uh, whisk, you know, that you can use it for cooking or for other purposes, that kind of thing. So she's kind of taking some of the things within the Indigenous Two-Spirit community um, and talking about them in a kind of in a humorous way. Dating advice, uh, things like that, so yeah. Asking, just mm -hmm. out of curiosity, um, <clears throat> I was having a conversation with someone about uh, Radcliffe Hall mm -hmm. and whether or not we should use they. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I'm wondering, as, particularly since you said there is no gender pronoun mm -hmm. in most, if not all, indigenous languages, but you used gender pronouns. Yes. So had, have you ever thought of using they instead? And have you, right. have you had this conversation with yourself or others about? Actually, that? just the artists in yeah. terms of what they prefer their pronoun, yeah. pronouns to be used. But I mean, when yeah. talking about the older, like the people from the 1800s? I don't, yeah, I'm about. not sure. I'm so not sure because it, it, it gets, I guess, um, I haven't really, really thought about mm -hmm. that in terms of it because I'm, I'm not quite sure if that's how they, they're not around for, for you know. Is, and yeah. also, too, like that is kind of like this English um, this idea, so using the terms like nahle, which is a Dene word, um, and I don't believe there's one in the Seneca language that would be uh, re referencing to uh, go one go. Uh, so yeah. So mm -hmm. I guess maybe I can ask you then, what does mm -hmm. it mean when you call like go one go she? But uh, mm -hmm. more especially thinking of right. call or con, the other the hosting or? hosting cloth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like when you call that person he, mm -hmm. what what is the what are the implications maybe? I, I can put it that way of doing that when right. they themselves didn't use he. Yeah. Right. If we use that. Right. Well, the, also the implications are in terms of um, the ways in which, um, like, by all rights, then we should just use the, the term Natalie. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, not utilize any of the English terms because that's come up in, uh, in cons also in terms of uh, mistranslation. Mm -hmm. um, and then what does it mean? This is like the, the terminology. Uh, I believe there was a book uh, that was written about, um, I'm blanking out right now, but um, part of the subtext of the title is um, man, woman, woman, man, you know, kind of thing. So that becomes, you know, complicated. So actually, in those instances where the words probably exist, those are the words that should be used. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, thank you for coming, and let's give another round of applause. Thank you, thank you.